I'm Joanna. Thanks for the intro, Kate. Um, my background is in back-end engineering. And um, yeah, I've been building microservices for years, uh, mainly request-driven uh, ones using API calls. So when I started working on um, event-driven architecture, I realized I had a lot of misconceptions about it. So this talk documents my learning journey um, with uh, the core ideas of event-driven architecture in the context of the core decisions I think you'll face when designing these systems. So let's start with the definition. What is event-driven architecture? This is my definition. I wanted to go for something that's really simple. Um, event-driven architecture, I think, uh, models a system as a flow of events. So events are defined first, and workflows are based on events. Events are not side effects. They're not just for analytics purposes. They're really first-class things. When learning about this, uh, there's all these event-driven patterns out there, and Martin Fowler has documented most of them. Uh, I had to create this mental map for myself of how they all relate. So I think the core one is event collaboration. This is the idea that services interact with each other by publishing events and then listening to them and reacting to them. This is, I think, the minimum for event-driven, and you can actually achieve this with a traditional pub-sub uh, infrastructure. Event streaming is going further with this concept and treating um, events like inputs and outputs of functions and doing stream processing like aggregating, filtering, uh, splitting up to compose workflows. Event sourcing is related. I think it's on its own branch in the architecture kind of ancestry tree. I'll talk about it a bit later. CQRS I won't talk about because that's a general architectural principle. It's a natural property of event streaming and event sourcing. And the two purple patterns, um, event notification, thank you, and event carried state transfer, talk about uh, you know, what's in events. I'll go through those. Agenda of the talk, uh, core decisions. One, should we use event driven architecture? Two, how should we structure events? Three, should we use event sourcing? Four, do we need the equivalent of transactions? And five, when should we make API calls? There's a lot of um, devil in the details around this stuff. I'm just going to go at a, a high level introduction for you of what kind of principles and, and choices you might need to make. But first of all, should we even use event-driven architecture? You can't ask this question without having uh, something to build, right? So we need a product to build. And imagine your mission is to build a library system for physical editions of books for the entire galaxy. No small uh, challenge. So the core to a library system is the checkout workflow, right? Uh, users are searching for books that they want to read. Then they'll check out some books. Uh, we'll have to add the books to the user's account so we know who's got which books. And then the books are magically teleported to the user. Luckily, I don't have to work on that part of the system. This is uh, probably a good fit for an event-driven architecture because the workflow is composed naturally of stages that can be represented as events. And we can also think of extending the workflow. So I might in future want a reminder service that will remind users when their books are due. So if we were going to do this in an event-driven way, um, events first, let's define the events. A nice technique for doing this uh, is event storming, which was coined by uh, Alberto Brandolini. It's a workshop format where you sit in a room with the business users, uh, sorry, the business people, and you identify the events that make up your business processes. So for us in our checkout workflow, uh, basics, we've got books checked out event, books added to user, and books teleported. And these map to real things happening. Um, a domain event uh, is something that happens. It's always in the past. And in the workshop, you can also identify who did it, uh, when, um, at what trigger, and then what's the data associated. So for example, user checks out books. A librarian, like in the old days, would add you know, to the system which, which uh, books the user had, and then who knows how they're being teleported. But 
You can also um, you know, identify your bounded context with subdomains. So for us, pretty simple here. Uh, checkouts, user accounts, teleporting. <laughs> Go mirror. And if we we're going to do this in the request-driven way, um, we would, uh, you know, maybe have a flow like this. The UI would do a post to the checkout service with the books to be checked out. The checkout service would do a post to the user account service to uh, add the books to that user, and then a post to the teleport service to say, teleport these books. So the checkout service is, um, it has to know which services to call to, to make up this workflow. And if I wanted to implement my reminders here, I'd have to change the checkout service to call the reminder service. The event-driven way, on the other hand, um, the checkout service doesn't have to call the individual services. It just publishes an event, books checked out, and then the other services listen to this and they know their job of what they have to do. So the user account, when it listens and hears a book checkout event, it adds the books to the account, and a teleport service will listen and then like figure out how to teleport those books. Then when we want to add the reminder service, we just have to get the reminder service to listen to the same event and do its job. And this is called choreography. I learned that there's a real reason why we say choreography instead of orchestration. So uh, orchestration in the previous flow, um, in an orchestra, back, uh, in an orchestra, the conductor tells people what to do when. Um, in choreography, the dancers learn what they have to do. And at performance time, they're all just magically doing their thing and achieving something together. So when thinking, should we use event-driven architects, you probably also want to know benefits and um, disadvantages. For the benefits, uh, this is uh, pretty funny. I got this feedback to make my talk more visual. So it's kind of turned into this abstract architecture pictionary. Can anyone uh, guess what architectural benefit of event-driven systems I mean with this? Yes, loose coupling, woo! Break the coupling. So both at development time and runtime, right? So I don't have to change the, uh, the checkout service at development time to add in the reminder service call. And uh, I don't, because I'm not coupled uh, to systems with APIs, I'm not you know, tied to the uptime of these other systems. Next one. <laughs> Unlocking a state that was in databases. So there's this idea of streaming your state. So all of this like data that was locked in our in our databases, we can now you know stream out um, live on the wire for anyone who wants to see and do something with. That sounds terrifying, but it's also really exciting because now you can inspect your business processes at real time and do new things with them. Workflows are extensible and uh, easier to compose new ones. And this is a record player. <laughs> so if you're uh, storing your domain events, uh, then you get this natural version history for your business data, which is fantastic. And as a final bonus, I think, um, the fact that domain events are immutable and you know, unrepudiatable, and you can do this like processing over them, like treating them as inputs and outputs and aggregating and filtering, it's a very functional mindset. It's a really nice way to design systems. The challenges, however. If you've come from a request-driven background, um, it's not to be underestimated the differences in design for this. If you're, um, you know, you're designing events and uh, topics and whatnot and figuring out schema management, but if you're um, designing these distributed uh, event-based workflows, you have to think, how does eventual consistency affect these workflows? How do I deal with errors? Event processing is fundamentally different from request processing. It's often serial in nature. So what happens when I have uh, an error processing one event? Do I hold up the processing of all the others? How do I handle duplicate events or missing events? And how do I scale this event processing? Uh, I actually think with event-driven, you think of um, scalability up front because you've got to think, okay, what's the partition key here? Can I partition this? The operational challenges, um, you have to, when you have these distributed event-based workflows, how do you monitor, trace, debug them, figure out if things are going wrong? Uh, you have to understand the publish and consume semantics of your event broker. If you're managing and hosting your own event broker, you have to figure out how to do that and how to tune it. And um, yeah, again, how do you scale these things? 
the tooling, it's evolving and getting better all the time, but it's probably not at the state as it is for uh, API uh, request-driven tooling, if you think about you know, circuit breakers and uh, service mesh and all that. I did uh, read the other day that there is a um, Zipkin plugin for Kafka now so that you can do your tracing of events through your system, which is really exciting. And then you might have uh, government, government, <laughs> governance. This is uh, supposed to be a town hall. Uh, governance challenges where um, you might need a security model on top of your event topics or uphold uh, requirements for GDPR. So given um, all of these challenges, uh, when you're thinking, should we use event-driven architecture? Number one, is it a good domain fit? Does your domain naturally have multi-stage workflows that you might want to extend? Is the audit history fundamental to the domain? Will it give you more value than just analytics? Are you going to do something with the events in real time? And can you invest in this uh, new tooling and learning? Question two. How do we structure events? So going back to these um, patterns, I'm going to talk about uh, event notification and event carried state transfer because I think they make real sense looking at them together. Event notification, I think, is a bit more of a relic of the past. It's just saying that you publish that something happened and you provide an ID and a link for people to call back to get the information. You don't really want to do this because the consumer then has to call back to the producer and you don't get that loose coupling benefit. Event carried state transfer, on the other hand, uh, says provide the data relevant to the event in the event so the consumer doesn't have to call back. And uh, this blog post helps me understand kind of um, the thinking and evolution to, towards this pattern. But it doesn't actually say how you should structure your events. There's many ways to do it. So I think the consensus is definitely for these workflows focus on domain events. And as an example, if we go back to the checkouts example of our books checked out event, what's that going to look like? Here's a possibility. It's in JSON. We've got uh, some metadata here common for all of our events. It says uh, the type of the event, the books checked out event, the event ID and correlation IDs are important so that we can trace our event through the system and which service published it and when. And then uh, we've got the actual data related to the event. So here I'm storing the user ID who checked it out and the book IDs of the books they checked out, when they did that, and the teleport method they chose at the time, priority. So it's going to be even faster than uh, speed of light. Some advice here, um, record the domain event in its entirety. So don't record it as individual events if it didn't happen individually. It's much harder to combine things uh, later than to split them up later. Pass entities by reference. Uh, don't include entity representation, representation in the payload. And the reason, there's two reasons to do this. One is that um, if, you, if I did include the whole user representation and I was doing that in multiple places in my system of events, if I wanted to refactor or change attributes, I have to change it in multiple places. And the second uh, reason is that in a DDD perspective, um, systems from different domains have different interpretations of what the user is. So you don't necessarily want to expose your view and make your consumers have to understand your view of what the user is. And don't add data for consumers that isn't part of the event if you can help it. So this is not API design when we're trying to make things convenient for our consumers. The core of events is modeling a business, uh, a business domain. So if the address was provided by the user at the time of the checkout, maybe it's like their preferred address or an override address, definitely store it. But if they didn't, don't put it in there for the teleport service's benefit. The teleport service can figure out, okay, I'll either get the latest address or the address at the time of the checkout. If you make the checkout service do this on behalf of the teleport service, you're adding coupling to that service. So uh, an alternative to domain events that I've seen are, uh, and I couldn't find a canonical name for this, but I like CRUD events, create, read, update, delete. Some people say CUD, uh, but I couldn't bring myself to say that. I guess I just did, but um, so because you're not reading an event. Um, these are not the same as CDC events, uh, change data capture events, which are specific to um, you know, database replication where you'll have the column names and before and after and specific um, to the database that you're dealing with. These events are representing the entity changes 
um, like kind of snapshots of, of the entity changing. You're always getting the latest version here. And so here is an example, say the book service is emitting these book updated events. And you can really tell it's that kind of a thing when you've got this last updated at timestamp. The problem with using um, the structure of events is that your consumers um, need to maybe know the business logic to infer things from the structure, from the state. So if here, for example, I didn't have like a checked out flag, the consumers would have to go through the checkouts looking for a checkout that didn't have an end date to know that this book was checked out. Or consumers might have to watch state variables. So if they're just interested in when the book was recalled, they have to be listening to these book updated events all the time, checking that this flag is changing. But the reason that these CRUD events are really appealing is that there are two use cases for events in our systems. One is for a workflow, uh, as I've mentioned, and the other is for data replica replication. So sometimes you want to build up a local replica of, um, say, books for a service and you want to, you know, you, it would be really nice to have this book kind of latest entity uh, CRUD events coming by that I could just, you know, always update my cache with that. So you might want to have these two types of events, but just don't use CRUD events uh, for implementing your workflows and see how far you get with just domain events and you can kind of transform and create these other types of events for these other purposes. And the general advice seems to be avoid command events uh, if you're tempted to use them or you see them. Command events are when the checkout service, instead of uh, publishing a checked out, book's checked out event, it publishes a teleport book command event to the teleport service. And this is really, I think, um, request-driven in events clothing because the checkout service needs to know still uh, what services need commands. So see if you can just, you can get away without it by creating like a result kind of event and, and others can react to that. So just to summarize, um, use domain events, have common metadata, record the domain event in its entirety, don't include entry representations or add data for consumers if you can help it, avoid command events. Cool. So should we use event sourcing? I think it's really easy to conflate event sourcing with event driven. I certainly did when I heard I was working on event driven architecture. I was like, great, I can use event sourcing. I always wanted to try that out. And my colleagues were like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> so I've learned that event sourcing is an example of an event driven architecture. It's not necessary for an event driven architecture. And it's really an application design pattern. So it's for one of your systems, not your whole ecosystem. So what is event sourcing? It's a fundamentally, fundamentally different way to store uh, your domain objects. So if you're used to uh, CRUD and relational databases, say, where we store the um, state of the books and, you know, the dotted thing here is your books class and your code, you're just reading from the state, changing the state. In event sourcing, uh, you're storing uh, the state changes or the events that happen to a book and you're deriving the current state either every time or from snapshots to create your class within your code. And this event sourcing idea, it's not new, it's been around for a long time, and I think one of the primary motivations are for systems that uh, have a strong need for an audit log, and the audit log must be correct, like in accounting, uh, where you, you know, if, so it's like a flip of, um, of direction, where instead of storing and changing the current state and having the audit log as a side effect, you store the audit log and you derive your state from that each time. Has these nice properties uh, where you can you know, rebuild if you've got models that um, are going to be different every time there's a new event and like kind of reads the whole history. You can create alternative histories, you can rewind and you can debug. So yeah, the main uh, thing that got hammered into me is event sourcing is a choice for within a system and event driven is uh, between systems. You can also just say, you know, maybe we'll use it for the book service, for the checkout service, but not for the user service, because user service is more, CRUD, CRUD is fine. I don't care when someone changed their display name. That's not pivotal to the domain for me. And you can use different technologies, right? So you could use something like Axon or uh, Event Store for your internal um, application event source uh, solution and some other technology for your overall ecosystem of events driven. 
But if you do have this, uh, make a strong separation between the internal events to the application and the external events that are shared between services. So typically you would correlate um, events uh, from the internal system what, which, to which ones can be published uh, for external interaction. The thing I think I was really confused about for a long time was that um, stateful event stream processing is very similar to event sourcing. I thought it was the same thing. So here, imagine you've got your checkout service implemented as a stream processor. You've got checkout requested events, um, and you're creating checkout events. And you're creating this like local replica or projection of book data, because I need to know about books for this to do my work. So the checkout service could be building um, its book view from the external book event stream. And so it's using the event, uh, event log as a source of truth, which is kind of the caveat, one of the core tenets of um, event sourcing. But it's not really doing anything. It's not rebuilding these uh, book uh, states every time. It's not like traversing history. It's not even part of the domain model, really. So there is a bit of a difference there. Really recommend this book, Designing Event Driven Systems, by the way, by Ben Stoplid. So to summarize, um, should we use event sourcing? It's a decision for a single application or service. And same as the previous, uh, should we use event driven? Is it a good domain fit? Because there's extra complexity that you're going to have to deal with and you want it to be worth it. Ask yourself, do you care about how the present state came to be? Do you care about who, what, or when, like an audit log? Do you need to rebuild or generate alternative histories as part of the application functionality? Or is what you're considering perhaps event stream processing? And just to summarize with this choosing the right fit for the complexity, uh, colleague Ian Cartwright says, I'd only use events and corresponding patterns where there is a good mapping to the actual business domain. I've seen teams tie themselves in knots trying to use events for synchronous business purposes and vice versa. Apropos synchronous business processes. When we're uh, creating, you know, when we had everything in one big relational database, we could use business, sorry, we could use database transactions to uphold our business constraints and deal with concurrency. When we move stuff out of uh, the big database to have you know, separate services, regardless of request driven or event driven, we have to deal with eventual consistency and what this means for our business flows. I'm not going to go into um, too much detail in this section because it warrants a talk in itself. I'm just going to look at a few scenarios and illustrate a few design decisions uh, that you'll be facing. And there's some nice properties, I think, of event processing uh, to help us here. So scenario one, concurrent requests to a shared resource. Example, only one user can check out a book at a time. So the first user to check out wins, the other users must sadly miss out. If we were uh, designing our checkout services as a stream processing app or as event sourcing, we might have these uh, checkout requested events kind of all you know, lined up and a checkout worker just going through one by one. And so we've serialized here the checkout requests and naturally we can nicely deal with this problem which the first one wins and the others will fail. Funnily enough, when I came up with this uh, example, so this works well for a single book because the question you have to ask, is, ask yourself when you have ordering is like, okay, so how do I scale this? I, the ordering is important so I can uphold this constraint of like only one user at a time. And uh, when you're thinking about scaling, you think, okay, what's the partition key here? I'll use, book, I'll use book ID so that all checkout requests for one book go to the same worker so I can uphold this, um, this constraint. That looks great. But I just said, hey, actually what happens in the domain is a user checks out you know, many books at a time. How do you partition an event with like lots of books in there? You can't really. So, and you can't just have one checkout request worker for the whole galaxy. So you might have to do something more uh, advanced, like splitting up, like still storing the checkout request events as they're coming in, but splitting it out per book and then collecting and waiting for that all to succeed. Another thing you're typically interesting is in, interested in is ensuring workflows complete. So it would be really disappointing if a user checked out their book and uh, it didn't get teleported to them, or we didn't know they had it and they could keep it forever. If your user service is down and you're not able to like, add it to the user account, what do you do? The nice thing about event processing is you've got this natural retry thing. You can keep retrying until uh, it succeeds. 
you've got a bit of a resilience uh, against service failure. If you've got logical failure forever, uh, for example, you might want to look into how you can do compensating or undo type of events. And lastly, how do you strictly enforce business constraints? So here's a more complex <coughs> example. Imagine I wanted to implement a policy so that you can't check out if uh, the user's over the, their limit. I need to check that they're not over their limit. You can design this in different ways depending on how important it is to you that the user doesn't go over their limit. If it's like people allowed five books and occasionally if they check out the sixth book, it's fine, you know, like, then an API call might be good enough, you know, and you might want to throttle your checkout events so that users can't take advantage of this and suddenly, like, check out 100 or so. But if you're really strict about it, you're like, no, we can't allow people to, like, check out six if we've set our limit as five, because otherwise they'll tell their friends and they'll get, like, jealous and, like, it'll be embarrassing. Then you might want to look into um, the saga pattern because you, you can create these more complex flows with like a checkout pending event uh, and deal with um, compensating events if, if things fail. Finally, when should we make API calls? So just because we're going event driven doesn't mean we never have to make API calls anymore. But if we now have two ways of interacting uh, between services, API calls and events, when do we use which? So I'll go back to the checkout service, reading from its store, publishing books, checked out events, forget about the UI part for a sec. Imagine I did want to implement this policy that a user can't uh, check out if, they've, if they're over their limit. I'll have to uh, somehow find out what the user's limit is. Um, maybe I want to all do the same thing for books. Maybe I don't want to allow a checkout if a book has been recalled. And you know, it's, um, the domain decision about whether you create a policy service, but let's just build the policy straight into the checkout service for this. I could use an API uh, calls. I could uh, get the books every time I've got the checkout and inspect their state, and same for the user accounts. Or I could uh, do this thing where I create a local replica of book status information from the book event stream, and similar uh, for user accounts and I use that uh, at checkout time. The cool thing about this is that if the user account service was, is down, I can, I can keep doing checkouts. But do I want to do that? Do you want to allow checkouts if your user account service is down and you can't tell if the user's over their limit? Probably not. So these are the kind of things uh, you need to be thinking about. Another example for API versus, um, I call them projections, creating these local replicas off event streams. Say we want to um, implement our reminder service to uh, look, out, look over all of the checked out books and for books that are due back tomorrow, send a reminder email. As inputs, this service needs uh, checked out, sorry, books and the checkout to know which books are checked out and users for their uh, email address. If I was going to use an API for this, getting this information, uh, I would have to like call the checkout service and ask for all recent checkouts uh, where there's a book due tomorrow. Like, first of all, dealing with collections over APIs, uh, like unbounded collections, how do you do that? Do you do paging? And then this like custom query of like, I just want to know the checkout book's due tomorrow. That's very specific to the reminder service. That shouldn't maybe be a thing that I provide for everybody in the checkout service. And then similarly, like if I were to get all the checkouts from the API, do I have to call the APIs to get each book and each user as I go through the, the loop? Uh, probably not. A nicer way is to create uh, your local um, copy of the data, so projection, reading from the book service um, events, the user account events, and the checkout events. And then you can do your queries and your joins uh, directly. You've also, um, in this uh, scenario, we're only doing this once a day or once an hour, uh, staleness is not, is not really an issue. It's okay for these services to be down for a couple of seconds or minutes. So to summarize, maybe use an API when uh, freshness of data is important. Asterisk there, because it's still a distributed system, so you're not going like, to get absolute latest correct version. 
Maybe use them when synchronous workflows are desirable, asterisk because you can imitate synchronous workflows with events. You maybe use them when you're answering business logic questions. So this one I think is really important. If you're building these local copies of projections of data, you want that to just be data. If you have to start using business logic to determine things about them and you're not the producer service, again, you're leaking your business logic, so consider APIs for that. And then projections are good when stale data is okay, doesn't change often. Runtime coupling is actually undesirable. You want to make sure things keep processing when other services are down. If you do fetching and joining over collections, and make sure you have good tooling for them. If you're going to make this projection a standard kind of element of your architecture, it's quite expensive to do it by hand. Find a way to make it cheaper and good ways of monitoring the replication flows. All right. Are you ready to build the galaxy's biggest library? Probably not. You're like, I'm sleepy. Give me a coffee first. Uh, if you are, the next question you might ask yourself is, what do we use for the event log buff store? And lucky for you, uh, David Peterson from Confluent is speaking next. So uh, he'll give you insights about why you might want to use Kafka. I just want to shout out um, thanks to all the thought workers who shared their insights. So one of the nice things about ThoughtWorks is there's this internal mailing list where you can reach thousands of people. And I've just been viewing these mailing lists with questions. Um, so many people, over 20 people, I started writing them all out, but it's too many, um, helping me form a better understanding of this, sharing uh, things that worked for them and things that didn't. In particular, I want to thank uh, Michael Strasser, Kevin Young, Alan Grimes, uh, Scott for some great talk feedback, and um, David, I've had great conversations uh, with about um, using you know, projections and events for data replication. And a huge thanks to Andy, Fiona, and Tina for helping.